Secrets and Spies presents Espresso Martini with Chris Carr and Matt Fulton. Welcome everybody to episode 9 of Espresso Martini with myself, Chris Carr and Matt Fulton. Now every time I hear 9... My mind seems to slip to a downfall video of Hitler going, nine, nine, nine. So we're on episode <laughs> nine, nine, nine today. So uh, welcome. Matt, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm I'm very good. And I uh, hate to inform you that Steiner's counteroffensive never took place. And uh, the Soviets are about a mile from the city center. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. That's not good. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, good, though. Dear. How are you? Yes. Well, I'm. I'm. As some people may hear in my voice, I'm recovering again from a cold. Uh, it's my third in six months. Um, not sure if I should be worried yet or not, but we'll see how it goes. People, feel free to drop me a DM if I should be worried, but um, I think it's okay. This one's gone relatively quickly, um, so I'm quite pleased about that. But uh, no, apart from the cold and catching up on a few things, I'm good. And we have a we have a third person with us today. Who is that? <laughs> uh, so I, I'm sure he's been down here. Uh, 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 squeaking a bit. So my cat Oliver is is here today. So usually for listeners, when we record, I'm in my office, right? Which I, I'm not today. I'm in my apartment. And so I, I've I was explaining this to Chris before we started. But so my cat here, Oliver, um, when I sit at the dining room table now, he assumes that we're going to play with the laser pointer that I have. That's like his favorite thing. And I have the laser <laughs> pointer sitting right here. But um so yeah now when he sits when i sit here he he thinks we're gonna play and he cries the whole time so you'll probably hear him <laughs> a couple times coming in and out but uh he's a he's a russian blue actually oh. um interesting enough sometimes i come out in the night and i see yeah. him with his secret radio uh uh sending messages back to <laughs> moscow center <laughs> oh Bless him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying to Matt, cats are very much a spy animal because uh, a lot of spies I've interviewed over the years, somewhere or another, I found out they're a cat person, and it seems to be more cat people than dog people. So I don't know what that <laughs> says about people working intelligence, but there, there's something interesting. There's somebody should do a study on that. They're but, very sneaky. There we go. <laughs> they're very sneaky. Yeah, they are. <laughs> They are. They are indeed. <laughs> well, today we've got a, a jam-packed episode as always, and uh, we're looking at a few stories that caught our eye in the world of espionage, geopolitics and intrigue, which is our area. And today we're going to look at a little more on our friend Jack Tashira, the man who was arrested over the Pentagon file leaks. Then we're going to take a look at a former FBI special agent who was arrested for his role in the January 6th attack. And then we will segue into some interesting espionage pieces that have recently come out. And if we have time, we're going to take a little look at some more information on the Nord Stream pipeline attack and a look ahead at the presidential elections in Turkey that are taking place this weekend. So we'll start with our friend Jack. Um, so we're, we're using a New York Times piece article as our basis for this. So we've, uh, it's titled War, Weapons and Conspiracy Theories Inside Airman Tashira's Online World. So I'll just go through some key points and then Matt, I'll come to you for your thoughts on Jack. So so for those who don't know, Jack Tashira was an Air National Guardsman who was implicated in the massive leak of classified information. He had a fixation on weapons, mass shootings, shadowy conspiracy theories, and trying to prove that he was right in his beliefs and in the know. The New York Times obtained more than 9,500 chat logs that were previously unreported, and they're all from Tashira, and they fill in a substantial gap that's been left by the court filings, and they offer important clues about his mindset. Tashir appears to have seen himself as the author of an insider newsletter founded to educate his online friends rather than being a whistleblower plotting a grand expose of government secrets. The messages provided a granular view of Tashira in his own words and indicate that his politics are dominated by his opposition to firearms restrictions. In the messages, Tashira shared US intelligence on Ukraine readiness, battlefield commands from the Kremlin, and secret arms shipments by American allies, along with reports of internal frictions on all sides. He frequently parroted pro-Russian reports, and uh, he consistently minimalized Moscow's setbacks during the war in Ukraine. 
Tashira posts indicate that he saw himself as an insider who was in possession of secret information that he wanted to share with his online friends. Members of Tashira's Discord group expressed their concern for him being found out, something that Tashira brushed off. Only later, bef just before his arrest, did he start to withdraw posting new documents citing that he was burned out from the war, but he did offer to field private information requests, which is quite interesting. The filing also includes an excerpt from social media chats from 20 2022 and 2023 in one of them prosecutors say Tashira expressed a desire to kill a ton of people and cull the weak-minded it's a really fun guy <laughs> while the post might be hyperbolic utterances of a young man it still presents a kind of worrying pattern there additionally according to a discord user who frequently communicated with Tashira he claimed to have been stockpiling weapons and military gear and discussed various ambitions including confronting protesters during the 2024 presidential campaign and hog hunting in rural New England. Now, I'm sure the hogs of New England are very happy that Tashira is now behind bars, as maybe <laughs> are some potential protesters for 2024. Um, so, so basically, Tashira didn't seem a particularly nice guy. So, uh, Matt, is there, do you have any thoughts on all, all this sort of stuff that's been kind of coming out since we last spoke about Tashira? I think the more that comes out about him, um, the kind of person that he was, the the the, the temperament that he had, his his conspiratorial thinking. Um, I think it's just more of an indictment of of the Air Force, you know, and just just the whole vetting process that we that we had. I mean, this is sort of the point that we made in our last episode when we talked about this. It's just it's stunning to think that that someone like this can get a top secret security clearance, you know. And we're going to talk about a, a story. Um, Next, of uh, someone in the FBI who, um, mm. you know, clearly should not have been there. Yeah, there's there's a lot with this guy that that is just interesting to unpack. I thought it was interesting that this uh, article here in the Times kind of spells out specifically that he he saw himself as basically running. I mean, like you said it in your in your intro, basically running like a Substack for his Discord. Mm gaming buddies to like give them like inside uh info on the intelligence you know world um it sort of explicitly rules out that he was doing this for any kind of real political or i'm saying there's an air quotes whistleblower uh motives he was purely just doing it for the satisfaction of his gaming buddies and so that he so that they would think he was um cool i mean even after you know, it says here that uh, he he stopped giving like sort of constant updates on the uh, invasion of Ukraine, but still sort of solicited like, oh, if you DM me, you know, and ask what you want to know about, I'll I'll tell you, which I, I don't know. This seems like a, yeah. a slam dunk prosecution. You know, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a prosecutor, but I don't know how you have more of a cut and dry case than this it says he's facing 25 years i would venture that he gets the 25 years you know is really just just egregious stuff here oh yeah it's appalling i mean the thing is so he was 21 and i think when he expressed the desire to kill people at school he was 16 yeah and obviously we see there are even more recent examples of this desire to you know harm people or you know go hog hunting um so <laughs> You know, it, 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 there's, there's definitely something there. And he was buying, he was collecting guns. He had something like 16 firearms. I saw some photos of some of them. Um, and, and uh, you know, he was definitely up to something. And then there was also, he had this um, sort of weird ambition to build a, a van for killing people. Um, and I noticed on one of the images from his bedroom on the cork board, there's a picture of like an armored vehicle. And I wonder if that supposedly this this dream van of his to kill people i don't know it's very very bizarre but i mean i just don't understand like you were saying how he could have passed some sort of psychological exam that i would have thought must be part of the process to get top secret security clearance yeah um because you know that that he was 16 years old when he said the things at school and he was in his probably about what 1920 when he got into this security clearance situation yeah. 
So it's not that long, is it? It's not that long. No. And, and I'm assuming family connections must have played a part in his getting through the process because he was from a career military family. Yeah. Um, and obviously his bedroom that was completely camouflaged didn't raise any eyebrows of his parents. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and, I, and like, I don't know, again, like with his, his sort of views, his political beliefs and stuff, which was supposedly right of centre, and they kind of line up with a this few libertarian not... talking points and talking... Yeah, yeah. I, this is... To say that I, I, I sort of took issue with how they how they frame that in the in the article. I mean, yeah. no, no disrespect to the people whose, whose bylines are, are in here. I mean, they're really great people, like Eric, Eric, Eric Toller and stuff, but I, I would push back mm. against the assertion that these are right of centre views, I think, is, is putting that charitably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very strange sort of way of framing it isn't it but uh, yeah so like i i just he must have been was he not expressing this sort of stuff at home were there no indications at home that there was some problematic behavior going on you know again it made me think of like uh historical cases of mass shooters where you know for some reason members of the family just don't seem to raise an eyebrow by the fact that their child is amassing a huge arsenal of weapons they seem to spend all their time focused on military stuff or weapons and so on um and not behave you know not doing kind of other things and I, and i just wonder is it a is it sort of denial is it ignorance or is there some complicity on some level with some of this i just don't know it's really weird so yeah there there is uh a a long and storied uh precedent for um people who who have sort of violent ideation and fetishization mm-hmm. of military culture um you know guns war all that kind of stuff that tend to lurch toward um violent fantasies mm-hmm. over over time um i'm reminded even just the description that you gave uh earlier of a guy um that i will venture most people listening to this podcast had never heard of before um someone by the name of uh Howard Unruh who on um September 6 1949 in Camden, New Jersey, so a city right across the Delaware River from Philadelphia, about 10 minutes from where I'm sitting right now. Um, he was a, a World War II veteran. Um, he was uh, in a field artillery um, battalion, saw a lot of combat in uh, Germany. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, he left the apartment that he shared. He was 20, 28 at the time. Uh, left the apartment he shared with his mother, Frida, on River Road in Camden, and um, shot uh, t- 13 people in, in 12 minutes, um, I think it was. Uh, and that was the country's first, that was America's first mass shooting. Um, you know, there's other, mm-hmm. there's other instances of, you know, massacres of Native Americans or enslaved Africans. I believe there was another shooting in Kansas, and I think it was 1913, um, that mm-hmm. sort of is kind of mass shooting adjacent, but... Um, Unruh's story is the first um, account that received widespread uh, uh, media attention of of a type of uh, shooting that that meets that that meets the FBI's definition of a mass shooting, which is a killing of I think it's three or more people in one area without a cooling off period. Um, and yeah, he had Unruh had uh, not to veer too far off course here. Unruh had kind of the same. Mm. Um, fascinations. His uh, bedroom in his mother's apartment was full of lots of memorabilia um, from his time in the army. Um, he uh, the 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 weapon that he used in the shooting was a German Luger, nine millimeter Luger uh, that he bought in Philadelphia after the war. It's not like one that he uh, took and took in Germany and and brought back. Um, but he had a, a, a whole bunch of um, carbines. He had an M1 Garand, um, a few shotguns uh, kept in a trunk in his um, bedroom. And uh, in the basement of the building where his apartment was, um, Unruh even built a like makeshift uh, shooting range with a steel plate and a few stacks of newspapers that he would go down and, and have target practice. And his mother 
was upstairs. Um, his his mother had had a lot going on herself. Their relationship was a little um, strange to to leave it at that. Um, but yeah, no, you would you would think that if your you know son is having f- shooting practice in your basement, that you would you would say something. But um, I guess for a lot of these people, it seems totally normal, and it just doesn't get caught. I mean, to that point though. Um, Jack Deshera and the article mentioned this, he, he had these kind of ideations, but he never acted to, to, to commit a, a mass shooting or at least not, mm. not yet. Or there's no evidence that, 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 that we've seen that he was actually moving to do it. But yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff you see here like this, 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 you know, mm. I don't know, like this Mad Max looking van that he was trying to, you know, build or talked about building or something. Yeah, that's very disturbing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the picture I think on his cork board. It did look very Mad Max-ish, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, indeed. It's just, yeah. So I mean, like, there's still people out there scratching their heads about what his motivations are, but it does seem to me it's sort of that toxic mix of conspiracy theorist beliefs and his ego, because mm-hmm. uh, he, he seemed to be getting off on this idea that he was a holder of secrets and stuff. And also he believed, I think he was on some sort of um, kind of quest to find out the quote unquote, the truth about mass shootings, because he seemed to believe that ultimately the US government were behind mass shootings, because I think in, with his belief in second amendment rights and stuff yeah he thought that the american government are faking mass shootings to enact like gun control um now with all the mass shootings going on not a lot of gun control seems to be happening in america i mean there's a mass shooting virtually every day now yeah um so yeah it's very weird he, i think he thought he was the new q of QAnon. You know his own little QAnon. It did. It did. It does kind of feel like that. That he 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 liked having this um, audience. Um, I, I mean that that uh, the idea that he's pushing that mass shootings are like an inside job that the government has advanced notice of. And there, yeah. there's a quote in this article um, says something to the effect that. Uh, um, yeah, there's probably going to be a, a mass shooting on Monday and then another smaller one coming up on, on, on Wednesday, oh, yeah, yeah. which to be fair, yeah, I could say, guys, there's probably going to be a mass shooting this week. And chances are there's probably going to be a mass shooting this week. I don't need to have insider knowledge yeah. to predict that. And it also doesn't mean the government is behind it. I mean, that kind of conspiracy that, you know, oh, uh, mm. Uh, mm. mass shooting, government did it, false flag, because, you know, they want to shred the Second Amendment and stuff. That really came to be after Sandy Hook. Um, I think it was the first time that kind of uh, conspiratorial thinking really came out into the mainstream. And I think in a lot of cases, you know, that's that's where at least morally we sort of lost the argument. I mean, if if someone can go into a classroom of six and seven year olds and massacre them and we don't do anything about it, I don't know where you go from that. It's mad, isn't it? The whole thing. But yeah. yeah. Um one one thing that just popped into my head is you're mentioning about his so called predictions. I mean <laughs> he managed to pick the two days that nothing actually did happen, <laughs> which is pretty good. Um but there's a great but there's there's a great saying um about broken clocks they're always right twice a day yeah because obviously their hands are stuck on a particular thing yeah. so beware of of people who make predictions and occasionally they come true by luck you know doesn't mean they're always right so <laughs> his stepfather i believe was not at the time that he was mm. part of this unit but was previously i don't know if he was he was an officer or an or an or a senior enlisted personnel but um he was he was in this unit at quite a high place in this unit um and there's been some discussion that if you know because he was this guy's stepfather uh that you know he just sort of love uh, they just look the other way on him um either way it's quite it's possibly. yeah just yeah. It, it's shocking to see that that someone who so openly espouses this kind of conspiratorial thinking and and even just beyond conspiracies just just weird kind of um just very very dark world view that that you would give them a top secret security clearance you know when we talked after the show last time that we talked about this uh i got some 
pushback on on Twitter. You know, someone came back and said, you know, the thing I love about this story now is that everyone's like an expert counterintelligence officer and that, you know, oh, they would have caught it. And <laughs> oh, yeah. I said, like, you don't have yeah. to be you don't have to be George Smiley to see that, like, this isn't isn't good. You know, what is it? And, and to be fair to you, it's not like you're some average Joe who doesn't really look you we you and i spend a lot of time looking at spy stuff a lot more than most people and so you know i think you know your opinion is informed um and that person on twitter was just i don't know very mean-spirited of them to say that um and uh, you know i do get that on twitter generally there is a lot of people who suddenly become experts and all sorts of things yeah a few funny memes about it yeah, Dr. Dan Lomas shares one of some bloke in a field and he says, Father, you're an expert on and whatever it is today. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. It's, it's a funny one. But yeah, it, it, it doesn't take an expert to see that there's a problem. And it's a national security problem, which should be concerned to you. Yeah. And it's not an isolated problem either because it's happening a lot. We we actually, we weren't really going to plan to talk about this today. There isn't really much to say. But in the UK, just after our episode, um, a young man in the British military, was arrested for trying to share secrets. I, there's not enough information in the public domain at the moment to give us an indication about what he was trying to share or why he was trying to share it and who he was trying to share it to. But it was just fascinating, just days after we spoke, that, yes, there's another one in the UK. Yeah. And then, you know, and, and I said on the previous episode, there's this sort of profile. Um, uh, and there's this sort of pattern now of people on the who have far-right beliefs who are either leaking information or giving it to, like, the Russians, um, or they're getting involved in what we're going to talk about in a minute, January the 6th. Um, yeah. and, and I think there is... And I think there seems to still be a blind spot within the, U, uh, the US government and potentially the UK government too to this issue of basically far-right individuals within their ranks in the military, police, and intelligence services. Um, so and as we chat... Uh, further in a moment both the next story and even potentially the iranian story we're going to look at in a minute might well have uh hints of there's something gonna going on um yeah. behind the scenes but anyway um and it sounds like oliver wants to have a final word he there. has he has very <laughs> important thoughts on this that, that that need to be heard i'm kind of trying to shoo him away right now <laughs> is he like groot where you can kind of like every meow has a, a different meaning yeah yeah they, he gets his his meows are translated in some pretty foul ways sometimes it's like damn you heard yeah <laughs> that was a vile thing to say oh <laughs> You know, just on a tangent, I saw the most amazing thing uh, just on, what was it, Thursday last week, just before I, I ended up in bed for a few days. So uh, I was walking along a, a path and there was this lady kind of doing a tick noise, a sort of kind of noise. And I was like, what is she doing? And she was just sort of standing around making this noise, looking around. And she was walking her cat with the power of this noise. <laughs> and I was like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Oh, I love that. I would love to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, because cats are run ruly. I mean, I've seen, I've, there's another lady I've seen in the past who has a, a, a leash for her cat and walks it around. Um, but this ticking thing was new. And that was like, wow, this is impressive. <laughs> And I think Oliver's impressed there by the sound. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we uh, look at the at a, um, another interesting story, which is invo involving an FBI agent who was involved in the January six yes. attacks? So, um, so we've got an article here from NBC, which is titled "Ex FBI Agent Who Fed Say Urged January Six Rioters to Kill Police Works for Terrorism Task Force." So, I'll just give you the key points, and then Matt, I'll come to you. Um, so, former FBI official Jared Wise, who was in charge of homegrown violence extremism for the FBI New York Field Office Joint Terrorism Task Force from 2014 to 2017, has been charged with four misdemeanor accounts for allegedly urging rioters to kill officers during the January 6 attack on the U.S. Capitol. According to an FBI affidavit, Wise yelled at officers outside the Capitol, calling them Nazis and Gestapo, and urged others to kill him. To kill him, kill him, kill him. Now, I'm not judging, looking at his politics. I wonder if 
why he was upset about Nazis and Gestapo, but that's another thing. Um, anyway, so Wise was described by a former law enforcement official as a loner who struggled as a leader and brought his dog to work despite being told that animals weren't allowed in the federal office building. Uh, I mean, a fun meeting. Um, and several current and former law enforcement officials, along with military veterans and active members of the military, have been arrested in connection with the January 6th attack. And an email requested through the Freedom of Information Act warned that many within the FBI were sympathetic to the mob. One military veteran, Jose Pazia, was convicted on 10 counts on Wednesday. So, Matt, what are your thoughts on all of this? This is, again, it's like... Um... I mean, yeah, it's just kind of the shock that 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 he was in charge of homegrown violent extremism for the FBI's Joint Terrorism oh, man, Task Force. Yeah. It's like putting Anwar El Awlaki in charge of CIA's Counterterrorism Center. <laughs> I was surprised he didn't try that. <laughs> yeah, Awlaki was an American citizen. Oh god. Um, <laughs> it's it's again. This is just an indictment of of the vetting processes i mean and there there mm. there there's an internal unit inside the fbi that that monitors uh employees social media accounts just for these sorts of issues like you have to i think it's every five years you, you have to sort of come up and do a, a a polygraph test a background investigation they sort of renew that whole process every five years even after you're employed i believe is what the fbi does um yeah, yeah. Like, how how do you, how do these people get through get through the cracks? And I, I don't know that it's so much even getting through the cracks at this point. They're just they just walk through the front door. Um, there is yeah yeah there there, there is a, a, um there is a greater issue here in that I mean. Since January 6th, especially since 2020, when we've seen kind of this explosion of far right domestically based terrorist incidents like, you know, um, the various attacks on on power grids that we've seen in in, in recent mm -hmm. years that are thought to be mm -hmm. linked to far right groups um, trying to start a race war. Um, it, it, the problem here is that the, the, the FBI's hands are kind of tied in 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 dealing with it you know because because um they are american citizens and and first amendment rights give them uh broad protections um and the fbi just doesn't have the legal authorities to really surveil and uh prevent these people from acting you know before they do something um, to the same extent that they would uh, if it was an Al Qaeda cell operating in the U.S. or a Chinese spy ring, you know, that'd be very easy to roll up. Um, but because they're Americans and and the First Amendment protects the First Amendment protects your right to fly a swastika from your home if you want to, you know. Um, of course, I mean that doesn't the First Amendment doesn't protect your right to be free of consequences of that. Um, you know, but, but the first amendment says the government can't take action against you simply because, simply because of that. Yeah. Well, one key thing, I mean, obviously, yeah, the FBI do struggle at the moment with, uh, the first amendment and sort of arresting people for these beliefs, but one would hope that they could at least clear their own house, um, yes. and sort themselves out because yeah. this is a big issue, uh, that keeps cropping up and we've had Charles McGonagall not long ago. Um, and there's something going on in this New York field office because I've I heard reports from back in 2016 that it was very openly pro-Trump inside. And obviously you've now had you've had McGonagall and now Wise who are both in this office. They weren't in the same department, but I'm assuming they might have shared the same break room or something. There's something something weird was has been going on in that New York field office. I don't know if it's still going on there now. And obviously, again, in this article, it mentions that there's been warnings that there are many within the FBI who were sympathetic to the January 6th mob. That lot need to go. Yeah. It's not politics. It's not far. It's not right. It's not Democrat, Republican. These people who are supporting Trump, supporting the, you know, the January 6th attack are fascists and they need to go. They should not be in any form of law enforcement at all. There's a there's a difficult line to draw between okay you're mm. you're in law enforcement you're an FBI officer you're an intelligence officer there's a difficult line to draw between being in those positions 
and and having right wing perhaps even quite substantial right wing views and then being purged because of that you see where i'm going here that it's mm. it's it, it's it's mm. tough and i think wrong to say that that anyone who still to this day who is in the fbi or you know the intelligence community who supports trump has to be kind of of fired i mean i think that definitely falls under first amendment well, protections yeah. and 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 you see mm, how mm. those same kind of instruments that would be used to to purge those could in you know in a change of government in a few years down the road that mm. that could still happen oh yeah, um, yeah. could be used to purge yeah. people who don't have uh who who don't have right wing mm. uh uh leanings um so that's 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 mm tricky and that's i mean yeah so there's there's mm. a... well what about support for the january 6 attack that that surely that's different. is a line that was crossed i i'm i'm totally with you there that if you uh are mm. are sympathetic to a mob that tries to uh illegally storm the capitol building and prevent the peaceful transition of power in an effort to um to basically overthrow the u.s government i mean yeah i think you 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 forfeit your your role um in the fbi uh but again until and this has been kind of this has been the issue for the fbi in and and law enforcement broadly in combating these groups is that until they act until they you know, go to uh, blow up a power substation or until they try to storm the Capitol, th there's not a lot that can be done um, because until it moves into that kind of operational stance, it's 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 protected. It's protected speech. You know, if it was again, if it was if it was Chinese spies, if it was if it was an Al Qaeda cell, you know, just just from the point of them, I don't know, casing a target that could be enough to roll them up. Mm. Um, mm. it's, it's, mm. it's, it's hard. And I think it's something that, um, not Americans look at and see, you know, why can't you just, why can't you just roll them up? Um, yeah. and, and yeah. Yeah. it's easy. Yeah, just roll them up. Convention would say, would say, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I mean, the way the first amendment and, and, and civil liberties and, and privacy mm. concerns, go here it's it's kind of just deeply ingrained in our culture and it's a very it's a very hard thing to tackle um i mean that said yeah the the fbi should be able to your point earlier should be able to kind of uh uh keep its own house in order same thing with the with with with, with the air force I, I think there's also i think there's an there's an inherent bias because there because even people who have kind of far right dangerous leaning ideologies are still seen as mm. Americans. So they're one of us, I say in air quotes, in the sense that um I don't know, people who sympathize with Islamic extremism or something are are kind of otherized naturally. So it, it's easier to sort of mm. Mm. move against them if that if that makes sense. I know that there does seem to be an attitude sometimes in America that Americans surely wouldn't betray America. Um, and even though obviously there's countless sort of uh, spy stories that go against that, but I still think there is a little grain of that sometimes in um, in U.S. thinking with regards to this issue, especially with uh, these characters. But uh, but yeah, there are no easy answers. I mean, I could easily turn into James Jesus Angleton and, and cause all sorts of chaos if I wanted to, but it'd be a very bad, bad thing. <laughs> Some of the thinking here is that, you know, this guy um, uh, with the FBI and and Jack Deshera and stuff and, and, and other people who are in the government, I'm sure, who have these kind of far-right ideologies, they don't see themselves as acting against America. Oh, yeah, they see themselves as the true patriots, sort of, yeah. Right, exactly. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think it's, it's very cut and dry that, yeah, if you, if you agree to spy for the Russians or the Chinese or something that it's accepted that, yeah, you're, you're a traitor and you're acting against America, but these, these, these guys don't feel that way. I mean, they see the federal government as this kind of tyrannical, uh, illegitimate force that's been sort of placed over mm. them by 
illegitimate means. I mean, that's the whole kind of crux of the 2020 uh, election conspiracy. And and they're the true patriots working to to bring it down and um, install an American government that functions in their ideological image. And does this have its roots back to the ending of the Civil War? This idea about the, the evil federal government, etc. Kind of. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these... Uh, a lot of these issues that, I mean, I, I remember having conversation with someone, it was like weeks before the 2016 election and, and he called the election, the last battle of the civil war. And I think he's right. Um, and in many ways we're still fighting the last battle of the civil war. I mean, after, after the civil war during reconstruction, there were laws placed to prevent people who served the Confederacy from serving in public office again. But but it wasn't taken far enough to like a debathification level. Does that make sense? You know, so mm. like after the invasion of Iraq, yeah. the debathification yeah. process purged anyone who was a member of the Bath Party from serving in any sort of public role ever again. And that included people like teachers and and sort of low level bureaucrats, because in that system, same way with Nazi Germany, in in that system that if you wanted to serve in any kind of public level at all. Again, even someone like a teacher, you had to be a member of the ruling party. So when you like outlaw the Bath Party or the mm -hmm. Nazi Party, you purge tons of people who weren't, you know, Saddam Hussein or, you know, some high level uh, SS um, um, functionary. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you had those beginning strains of like the lost cause movement that kind of, you know, lingered and bubbled up um in the south you know like the what's a group i think it's the daughters of the confederacy or something but you, and then mm -hmm. that percolated mm -hmm. back up through jim crow laws you know where a lot of the the you know in summer 2020 after george floyd those protests where uh, a lot of confederate monuments and stuff came down i mean those monuments were were built in the early 20th century as sort of monuments to 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 jim crow laws to to entrench um, those laws, not so much to remember the Confederate dead so much. Um, yeah. And we're, we're, we're still, we're still dealing with that today. It's, it's, it's the same kind of cultural racial divisions that aren't so much pure left and right ideology. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. I was just thinking of um, a John Mulaney sketch, uh, one of his stand-up things where he was like, what they're nazis they're nazis again you know <laughs> and it's like yeah sadly we live in a world today where there are nazis again <laughs> like it's it's shocking but it's uh it's yeah. it's back and and unfortunately there seem to be quite a few of them coming out of the woodwork at the moment i would venture that a lot of these people like jared wise who were at the capitol and screaming at the police i'm quoting him here you're disgusting you are the nazi you are the gestapo mm -hmm. i don't think they associate that term uh, they wrongly incorrectly don't associate mm -hmm. that term with the nazi ideology i think for them nazi and for a lot of people on the on the on the far right nazi has just become like a catch-all meaning for mm -hmm. oppression mm -hmm. you know yeah i remember during the bush administration that term was very much overused on yeah. the left um to the point where when they're actual nazis it's it's lost its value um there's there's something to be said uh -huh. in that actually yeah that nazi doesn't just mean mean bad person who who is oppressing me and stopping me from doing and saying the things that i want to do there's an actual quite complicated racial and political ideology behind the nazi party and of course you know in mm. in the mm. kind of idiocracy that we live in now all of that gets lost and just a catch-all term for general bad guy who's preventing me from doing the things that I want to do, which of course mm, is wrong. Yeah, yeah, and they make good villains for Hollywood movies too. So. They do. <laughs> well, until until recently, I think. But yeah, oh dear. I was just, you know, what? Um, we were talking about it a few episodes ago. The Sum of All Fears, such an mm -hmm. interesting film because the film's so different from the book in the sense that in the film they made it the Nazis were the bad guys. But I'm wondering now that's prof a prophetic choice rather than a safe choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh dear. But there we go. Well, look, shall we shall we move on into um, espionage? 
You up for a bit of espionage? Of course, always. Excellent. Well, there was a really interesting story that caught my eye about an Iranian spy who was executed in January, and he was allegedly working for Britain's MI6, or Secret Intelligence Service, if we go by its proper name. So um, the New York Times article that was all about this is titled Iranian Insider and British Spy, How a Double Life Ended on the Gallows. So the recent execution of former Iranian Deputy Defence Minister... Ariza Akbari, on espionage charges by the Iranian regime, has revealed that he was a British spy who had been providing high-level access to the country's nuclear and defence secrets. According to officials, Akbari had long lived a double life and had begun sharing Iran's nuclear secrets of British intelligence in 2004. He had provided valuable intelligence that proved critical in eliminating any doubt in Western capitals that Iran was pursuing nuclear weapons and in persuading the world to impose sanctions against Iran. In 2019, Iran, with the assistance of Russian intelligence officials, discovered that Akbari had revealed the existence of a clandestine Iranian nuclear enrichment facility called Fordo. And Iran accused Akbari of revealing its nuclear military secrets and disclosing the identity and activity of over 100 officials, including the chief nuclear scientist Mozen Farkrazada, who the Israelis assassinated in 2020. Britain has never publicly acknowledged that Akbar is a spy, which is quite typical. The motivation for Akbar's actions remain unclear. So, um, Matt, what are your thoughts on this story? Because it is a very interesting story, and I do urge everybody to read that article, because it is a really fascinating true spy story yeah this is a very i don't want to say cool because uh mr akbari was executed um it's it's interesting to see this story come full circle um i have been aware of this guy for a while um i remember like in in you know my research for the novels and stuff that's kind of heavily centered on on iran's nuclear program or at least a version of it um mm-hmm. I, I remember this guy coming up uh, uh a few times um i'm really struggling to see quite his motivation mm-hmm. i mean i'm not i'm not doubting that he did what he did i'm sure he was a spy for mi6 um but it's uh, this article goes through a lot about how he still kind of espoused the regime's um views on on a lot of things yeah yeah he was supposedly a staunch conservative and he was a commander in the revolutionary guards wasn't he yeah very much in line with the ruling ideology of the irgc and the uh, iranian um regime and quite possibly involved in all sorts of stuff um from in the 80s and things that were probably quite questionable oh yeah i mean he was the he was the deputy defense minister um uh served as a few in a few different advisory roles on the Supreme uh, National Security Council, um, yeah, he definitely had his hands in a lot of stuff. Especially if you're in the IRGC, I mean, their their mm. their mission is to you know officially uh, export the um, Islamic Revolution worldwide. I mean, so if you're in the IRGC, you're you're kind of at at at, at the vanguard of that of that um, mission, but. Yeah, okay, so it says here, uh, Iran has said that MI6 paid Mr. Akbari nearly £2 million, currently about $2.4 million. Um, it, it could simply be money. I wonder if if there was some uh, deeper ideological struggle at in going on within him, uh, within him and if, mm. if these kind of, you know, oh, yeah. what he yeah. says, the stuff he says, it's very clearly kind of standard party line stuff. If if you know deeper inside he had some uh, more misgivings, I don't I don't know that we'll ever find out. I mean, I'd imagine MI six definitely knows what his motivations are, but they're not going to tell us anytime soon. Um, probably no. decades no. before that stuff is declassified. Maybe not even in our lifetime. To be honest with you, so no, many probably even not. From World War Two that are not declassified. So yeah, yeah. Because there's a lot of sources and methods and stuff like that. Also, very interesting that they seem to have kind of lured him back to Tehran to arrest him. That reminds me of something I learned about the fate of Russian spies um, who who work for America. A lot of them get recalled to Russia, mm-hmm. and uh, and the, what it is, they have this st- awkward stop at I think it's Shannon Airport in Ireland where they have to refuel the plane, and um, 
up until that moment, the person on the plane, the the supposed Russian spy, could easily get off the plane and leave, and not much could be done about it. And so they put on this ruse that that oh yeah, you're going home a hero, you're being you know promoted or whatever to so keep that person on the plane. They treat them with champagne and what have yeah. you. Um, and then once it leaves Irish airspace, everything changes. Um, and I've always been fascinated by that little stopover. So yeah, this guy obviously was recalled back to to Iran. So yeah, carry on. Sorry. Um, well, there's been stories too in the past of uh, Mossad luring people to third countries, like uh, they would lure them to like Rome and stuff. You know, uh, they had honeypots mm-hmm. and stuff set up in 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 mm-hmm. in Rome, and they would you know have have their target kind of you know start an affair with um with an asset who they had that would yeah that would lure them to a country like Rome where they could or a, a city like Rome where they could more easily uh you know throw a bag over their head and whisk them off um to Italy. Iran's nuclear program has kind of had a really fascinating uh trajectory. I mean it's all in upheaval now with the JCPOA essentially being um dead. Mosin Fakhrizada um, it seems that uh, Akbari kind of uh, burned to MI6 and gave the intelligence that eventually led to his assassination in, in 2020. Um, it sort of was meant to be, and I guess will still be remembered this way if and when Iran gets a nuclear weapon, was sort of meant to be their, their, their Robert Oppenheimer. Um, I mean, there's been two kind of parallel tracks uh over the history of Iran's nuclear program, you know, one is the civilian nuclear power program that's run by their atomic energy uh, organization. Um, and then the other side, the, the you know, building a weapon has been kind of uh, governed by the IRGC. Um, various uh, quasi-military educational scientific institutes in Tehran, like the um, Oh, Imam Hussein University. I might have to check on that. I'm pretty sure that's mm. that's the one. The Imam Hussein University that uh, Mosin Fakhrizada was a part of. Um, and for a long time, the Iranians were secretly pursuing a nuclear program. And then in the early 2000s, right around the time of the Iraq invasion, I believe it was. I'm just speaking of this stuff off the top of my head. I don't have any um, notes to double check. It's all over in that shelf. Um in the early 2000s, uh, around the time of the Iraq War, um, the Iranians, Ayatollah Khomeini, shelved the nuclear program, stopped stopped its 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 development, but shifted a lot of these institutions that were involved in it. That you know, um, Fakhrizada led was at the uh, Physics Research Institute, I believe, was his group inside this university that was kind of at the forefront of their uh, weapons development program, shifted a lot of their work into uh, like dual use technologies. So if you're if you're building if you're building a nuclear weapon, there's two kind of common designs. So there's like the quote unquote gun design, which kind of shoots a pellet of I think it's uranium, but shoots a pellet into a, a uranium core. And that starts the 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 chain reaction. The other one is a um, implosion type bomb where you would have like a core of like plutonium two thirty nine or, or or uranium surrounded by uh, explosive lenses. Um, actually, if you watch if you watch the new Oppenheimer trailer, there's a really good shot of them assembling this thing in uh, Los Alamos for the for the for the Trinity test. But yeah, so you have like the fissile material core, and then around that you have conventional explosive lenses that um, have to be uh, milled and crafted to such kind of exact specificity because if there's any kind of of gap between these lenses when 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 the lenses explode if there's any kind of gap between them that fissile ma- that that fissile material can kind of leak out through the gaps and if you have that you won't have the chain reaction to cause a big nuclear uh 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 explosion so because you have to have these explosive lenses shaped to such exact specificity um a lot of the expertise and and the machinery used to create them can also be used um to create stuff like uh nano diamonds or even um Mm -hmm. the lenses used in uh, eyeglasses um so yeah a, a lot of that research that um that that they were 
using for a weapons program was sort of put on the shelf, not quite entirely shut down, but moved to these kind of research fields that that could be put back into a nuclear weapons development program um, in the future. And that's the stuff that Fakhrizada was uh, involved in. A lot of that research that the Physics Research Institute was was doing was at a site called Parchin, um, which is sort of southeast of uh, Tehran, a big um, explosives research facility. Um, the IAEA uh, has been trying to get in there for a long time. Yeah, that's, that's, thank you for that. Yeah, because obviously um, Akbari provided the you know so much sort of detail which only a human spy could do mm -hmm. um so i think this is a real big coup for mi6 this whole operation wasn't it they ran yeah. it for like 15 years this operation yeah. went on um and so i think this is a really interesting story and it kind of has that shades of the eli cohen um yes. israeli mossad operation yeah it reminds me of that and there's and when i was reading the article it's a guy in damascus right Mm, that's yeah. It. yeah 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 there's, and I, I don't know if you've seen the film with uh sasha baron cohen but uh, mm -hmm. uh there's a you know it's a very good film and, and there's a scene where you see him getting hanged at the end and um i was just thinking about akbari's funeral this sort of lonely funeral or memorial service because they, uh, he was buried by the government not the family but they had a memorial service yeah. that no one came to and i don't think anybody could go to that funeral because i'm sure the iranian intelligence services were watching it like hawks to make a note of anybody who went as potential collaborators or whatever yeah. um and those people probably would have been whisked away i mean I, I don't know for sure but i suspect that they probably would be watching that funeral i know like um u.s and uk law enforcement certainly watch funerals for certain interesting characters yeah. um so it's definitely uh definitely something that could have happened but um looking at his motivation because obviously not a lot is known but um uh -huh. i was just recently rereading a book called the new spy masters by stephen gray and in that book there's an interview with former cia agent milton bearden and he mentioned that most spies the cia ran during the cold war were middle-aged men and obviously akbari was 47 when he became a spy for mi6 and i do wonder because uh, again the most effective spies the ones who do, take the greatest risks and usually run without being detected for a long period of time are usually ideologically motivated so yes. i do wonder whether he was having i don't know some sort of midlife crisis some sort of change of thought some sort of maybe I, you know, my entire life I've been in the service of something I actually don't agree with. I don't know. I mean, I'm speculating there, but I do wonder if he was having second thoughts about the regime he was working for. Yeah. Again, also totally speculating here too, but I would wonder if his, I'm, I'm suspecting that his, uh, uh, very pro regime views that he espoused publicly, if that was a bit of a, a bit of a front after a while, I think was it, um, oh, yeah. Penkovsky uh, was really kind of thrown off the Soviets by the Hungarian uprising, was it? Mm, I think it was, yeah. I think yeah. that's when he kind of started making the decision that he would he would start spying. Yeah, and, our, and my favorite spy, Gordievsky, was the 68 uh, Drink. Uh, Czechoslovakia. Yeah, they are. <laughs> was, yeah the, the, Prague, uh, the Prague Spring of 1968. So. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would love to someday hear what this guy's motivation was um we won't hear it for a long time if ever i mean maybe who's ronan bergman write this wrote this uh article he's one of the bylines on here um i mean uh, yeah ronan bergman might might find out at some point and put it in a book at some point he definitely has the connections to do mm. it like the unofficial chronicler of israeli intelligence yeah he's definitely probably knows something off the record one other interesting thing so in the supposed confession tape akbari mentioned that he was recruited at a british embassy function now Looking at Milt Bearden again from this book I was reading, most CIA uh, agents run during the Cold War were walk-ins. Mm -hmm. Recruitment's almost a bit of a myth, a bit of locker room talk. Most recruitment, you know, as in somebody going out and physically recruiting someone doesn't really happen, or at least didn't during the Cold War. A very high percentage of effective spies, at least run by the CIA, were walk-ins. So I wonder if there's a grain of truth in this, where Akbari may have gone to the embassy function to seek out somebody at MI6. Because uh, uh, an embassy function is a perfect place to just yeah. put a word in someone's ear very casually, a little note in someone's pocket or whatever. Because obviously, he, if he was getting invited to embassy functions, he was on that kind of um, um, that sort of circuit, the ambassadorial circuit, etc. Um, so 
provides a good opportunity for him to do that. And I think most of his debriefs seem to be going on in the UK because he did move to the UK when he kind of retired. Um, and then was just traveling back and forth between the UK and Iran um, every so often. So I wonder if that uh, if there's a grain of truth in the British embassy function there. Um, but it's, it's no, very, very interesting story. Obviously, with a very sad conclusion of his um, execution there. And also... Um, one other thing that stood out for me, the Iranians got the information from Russian intelligence that Akbari was working for MI6. So I want to know, how did they know that? Was it via surveillance? Was it by a tip off somebody kind of personally connected to Akbari? Or worse, was it a, a mole working within Western intelligence, whether it be MI6 or a Western partner? You know, we've certainly seen recently there's enough pro-Russian individuals who've come out of the woodwork who, who've been within Western intelligence. And we've had, obviously, the BND officer. We had the British security guard at the Berlin embassy. And I can only assume MI6 and MI5 have done an internal audit, at least I hope they have, of anybody connected to the Akbari case. But I, I don't know. It's interesting because it was the Russian intelligence who provided the info. Uh, and whether they had a specific name or whether they just had pieces that then the Iranians sort of put together and put a top 10 yeah. list. And, you know george smiley style tinker taylor soldier spy you know <laughs> um whether they had to kind of go through and figure out who was the spy i don't know but there's there's something very interesting there you know not not entirely surprising because obviously iran is pretty much known as a kind of client state of russia so they're very much very close um with each other uh, and in fact, yeah. that was one of the plot points that bothered me in the TV show Le Bureau. Um, you've seen? Have you seen Le Bureau? No. Uh, to my to my shame, a bunch of people have have said, "Oh yeah, you got to watch it. You got to go. You got to watch it." I mean, definitely one of the better um, spy shows out there. I haven't. Mm. I just haven't seen it yet. I need to. Ah, uh, no. Well, he's, he's fantastic. I will give it ever so slight spoiler, but I'll throw it hopefully a bit out of context that so won't ruin it for anybody mm -hmm. if you haven't seen it. But there's a whole sequence involving. Um, uh, an Iranian who may or may not be working for Western intelligence. And eventually the Iranians sort of catch up to them and they're kind of blown. And then uh, uh, that same person comes up in another season, then operating in Russia. And to me, it was like, the Russians would know who this person is. Because you know? <laughs> they were yeah. in Iran, you know. So it's yeah. like, that, that was the only bit that to me struck me as a bit of a false note. But uh, but excellent TV show. That's the worst false note they ran. Um <laughs> You know, <laughs> it was a good show. Yeah. So uh, there we go. Matt, do you have any other thoughts on this story? Your point about how the Russians were able to burn him to the Iranians, uh, I think a mole is probably the most likely explanation. Mm, it could even be our BND friend. I don't know. You know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i i i think a mole is probably the most likely outcome yeah i reckon i reckon because they obviously yeah because there are lots of people who are deep within various west intelligence services so they probably got access to the intelligence that was shared via the five eye partners we put it that way and that information um gets back to iran that's going to be useful mm -hmm. for iranian counterintelligence so uh yeah one last thing i just remembered was this point out as well um when Akbari was arrested, and he was obviously held in custody from 2019 to 2023, he apparently was forced to log on to his computer and send false information to MI6. And that's obviously known as sending chicken feed. That's the term for sending false information to someone um, where the person receiving that information might think it's authentic because it's coming from a trusted source, but it all turns out in the end to be a load of nonsense. I wonder if MI6, A knew it was nonsense i'm sure they did but um and what kind of information was sent to them uh, what kind of chicken feed were they getting it's an interesting one it could be something as simple as you know yeah i'm i'm in tehran for whatever reason i was supposed to go to tehran for and i'm fine please don't worry about me we're totally fine as he's you know writing this with a gun to his head mm, and it's difficult for them to verify yeah near near impossible to 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 verify if i mean unless there's other agent reporting that in the analysis process or or in the collection management process that you would collate together with Akbari's reporting mm. and see, okay, what Akbari's saying doesn't make any sense compared to the other collection that we have. Um, I'm really interested just from my own selfish research reasons to know more about this computer platform that, that he was using to communicate with MI6. I mean, I'm sure it was probably just 
a laptop with some sort of custom made program in there that at face value would look totally normal, but it actually communicates back to MI6. Do you remember Morton Storm? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he, so it might not have been a computer. It might have been an iPhone because Morton Storm was given yeah. a duplicate iphone that had technology within it that was completely undetectable apparently that would allow him to covertly communicate with i think it was danish intelligence and then british intelligence as well because he was working for the british at some point so it may yeah. well have been something like that but who knows yeah yeah i i think that's 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 probably that's probably correct yeah it was on a, it was on a smartphone yeah mm, potentially obviously we don't know I mean, they probably have that technology for laptops too but smartphones are just a bit easier than the laptop to yeah to kind of keep covert aren't they <laughs> so moving on from iran we're going to go into other choppy seas now uh, and we're going to chat a little bit about the new information on the Nord Stream attack and uh, i'm just going to pull some information from a bbc article titled Nord Stream report puts russian navy ships near the pipeline blast site and this article was by gordon carrera who's actually been on this podcast he was on in 2020 um and we discussed a really good book of his on russian intelligence so just to summarize the key points so there's a there's been an investigative documentary that's reported that russian ships capable of underwater operations were present near the location where the explosion on the Nord Stream pipelines occurred the vessels were allegedly detected using intercepted Russian Navy communications, and it's still unclear what caused the blast, um, and formal investigations are still ongoing. The investigative report is based on details of suspicious Russian ship movements in the run-up to the Nord Stream blast, as reported by four Nordic public broadcasters and an accompanying English-language podcast. The ship included Russian naval research vessel Sibrikov and tugboat SB-123 and a third ship from the Russian naval fleet that could not be identified. These so-called ghost ships with their transmitters turned off, their movements were tracked using intercepted radio communications they sent to Russian naval bases. And the Nordic broadcasters do not claim to have conclusive proof of Russian involvement in the explosions. However, the documentary raises questions as the unusual nature of the activities of the Russian ships near the pipeline in the run-up to the blast and in the immediate aftermath of the explosion, some in the West pointed the finger at Russia whilst Moscow blamed Western countries. And more recently, there have been reports that it might be a pro-Ukrainian group or operatives working for the Ukrainian government itself. So, Matt, I know you had a really great chat with Shane Harris uh, yeah. gosh, nearly two months ago now about the potential Ukrainian angle. Yeah, it was in March, I think. Was it March? Yeah. And and so I don't know what your thoughts were on any of this new information and how that kind of lined up with your conversation with Shane and, and so on. Well, the interesting part here is that it, it really doesn't line up with the reporting that uh, mm. Shane and and others at Shane at the Washington Post and then others at the New York Times did on the you know news that um, was could have been pro Ukrainian partisans that were behind it over the course of this year leading up to that reporting in in March I think the prevailing theory about the bombing has come to be that it was you know pro Ukrainian partisans um, that did it this information runs absolutely contrary to it i don't think that this is it's interesting i don't think it's proof that the russians are behind it i mean so uh, this article talks about um russian naval vessels sorting out of kaliningrad and and um near st petersburg into the baltic i mean that alone isn't isn't really kind of suspicious at all you know it's like if uh, U.S. Navy vessels were spotted in the Gulf of Mexico, and then shortly thereafter, uh, a pipeline blew up. You know, I mean, there's U.S. Navy vessels all over the Gulf of Mexico all the time. That's not, um, you know, just the same way the the, the Russian Navy is all over the Baltic Sea all the time. That, that that alone in itself isn't suspicious. What is suspicious is that you had a essentially a task group of Russian naval vessels that are, um oriented towards undersea operations right so like a a a submarine rescue vehicle a navy research vessel um uh uh mini sub that what's suspicious is that that was a task force that was deployed out into that that was deployed out into the baltic around these dates and that they lingered in the area of the pipelines that's what's suspicious I mean, we've covered in the in the last episode um, 
spy ships up in the North Sea around around Scotland and stuff, you know, casing uh, power lines, wind farms and stuff. I mean, yeah, it could have been and just the same uh, documentary. This stuff came from. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could have been kind of the same operation. You know, they were out in the Baltic looking at other stuff that was near the pipelines. And it's just very kind of suspicious, if only coincidental timing. The one thing that really gives me pause about about you know rushing back to the initial talking point that yeah the Russians blew it up. The more you think about this bombing and the motivations for the different potential suspects to do it, I honestly don't. I don't see much of a motivation for the Russians to blow up Nord Stream. Do you? This I do actually. Um... I do. I think I, I've got two thoughts on it. So I think one is it could be just to make the point that they could do this and shut off the pipeline or any, you know, they obviously targeted a pipeline that's not in use, but they're kind of making the point that we could stop all the pipelines if we want to and kind of cut you off. Right. I think the Russians have always been wanting to kind of, uh, you know, they've always been accused of sort of uh, blackmail with the gas and stuff like that this is where a lot of the nervousness around Nord Stream originated before this explosion before even the Ukraine war there was a lot of talk about how Russia could use uh, create an energy crisis to you know make uh, western nations kind of bow down to their bidding so there's yeah. an element of that there or this operation was designed to create lots of speculation and lots of infighting. And we know the Russians, with their online activity, love causing infighting among allies. So I wouldn't put it past them, personally. I mean, the, the thing that stuck out for me is interesting, and I probably watched a bit too much of um, Homicide Hunter recently, and with, I was thinking, of what would Lieutenant Joe Kender say to this submarine being spotted? He would say, well, my, 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 that is interesting. This SS-750 DSRV submarine. I, I wanted to find out a little bit more about it, so I, I did a very quick digging on the internet. There's a guy called H.I. Sutton of Covert Shores, and he's sort of a submarine expert. And he mentioned that the submarine rescue ship, the SS-750, is an ideal vehicle for underwater operations. Yeah. And it's basically a crude submersible with manipulator arms. Mm -hmm. So those arms could easily put an explosive charge on something or it could snip a cable. And I know the Russians have been developing a submarine known as the Belgorod that's supposedly be able to take midget submarines to do a very similar kind of thing, to be able to cut yeah. cables and do underwater covert kabuki so i i i i don't let the russians off the hook just yet i haven't seen any evidence say they have done it but i haven't seen enough to say that they didn't do it either i don't yeah i don't want to let them off the hook either i guess if i'm analyzing the potential motives for the russians to blow up their own pipeline that wasn't even in operation and then deny it and then try to rebuild it versus the motivations of pro-ukrainian partisans to you know sever this crucial economic link between russia and 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 europe vis-a-vis -vis germany it, i see a greater motive for the for these pro-ukrainian partisans to do it you know um i don't i and again i don't i don't i don't know what happened you know um but yes this this task group that they definitely spotted out in the baltic doing weird fishy stuff totally has the makeup that you would want mm. to blow up this pipeline mm. um my mm. problem that i go back to is is if i'm yeah again looking at the motives of the russians to do it versus the motives of pro-ukrainian partisans who i mean i think the reporting bears out clearly have the capabilities to do it i mean in the discussion with shane we sort of talked about how mm. doing this mm. is not as hard as as you think i mean I, initially i think a lot of the skepticism towards towards anyone but the russians being involved is that well like oh yeah you have to have like a super powerful blue water navy special operations capabilities yeah, to pull this yeah, off yeah. and and you don't um it's not as hard to do it as 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 you would think yeah i don't I don't I don't know. I don't know. I think it's I think it's it's still very much possible that there was a Russian task group out there in the Baltic doing fishy stuff, but it wasn't mm. blowing up the pipeline. There was other stuff that they were looking at and it just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm. Mm.
I don't know. No, quite potentially. No, no, it's an interesting one. There's a podcast called Cold Fronts, and I'll put a link to the episode that covers this story because they have a really interesting interview within it with this former Royal Naval Intelligence officer who they named James, who apparently is the one who monitored the ship movements and managed to uh -huh. listen in on some of this interesting radio communication. Um, it's no, it's truly fascinating to listen to it, but uh, obviously the podcasters would not be able to definitively prove either way. Yeah. So yeah, very very murky, which is sort of nice for a deep water thing, really, isn't it? Murky, but there we go. so uh, last point of discussion for for today, um, I flagged this article for us. It's in Foreign Policy. Um, its title is "Yes, Erdogan's Rule Might Actually End This Weekend." Um, and, uh, it, it discusses the, um, upcoming Turkish presidential elections, which I believe are to be held on, um, Sunday. So this episode will come out on, on Saturday. Yes. The 13th. Yeah. That's it this weekend. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the day after this episode comes out, Turkey's having its, its presidential elections between, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who has been in power for a very long time, has kind of entrenched himself as a bit of an autocrat, honestly, um, which is awkward considering he uh, Turkey is a NATO member, the second largest uh, army in 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 NATO. Um, anyway, he's running a uh, very close campaign. I think right now he's Erdogan's closely in the lead, but not very far behind. Um, is his primary opponent Yamal Karistarolu is uh, leading a very close second to him. Um, uh, I so after the coup attempt in 2016, it, this article talks about this big sort of nationalistic rally around the flag um, effect that uh, uh, greatly increased Erdogan's um, popularity um, in recent years. That has waned in the last local elections. Erdogan's party lost a good amount of support, uh, especially in um, Istanbul, which is where Erdogan previously where he got national politics, was the mayor of Istanbul, I believe. But anyway, I wanted to bring this up because of the high chance that Erdogan might lose the election. In recent years, we've seen a, a lot of uh, instances in which a kind of autocratic, entrenched uh, uh, strongman loses at the ballot box. Um, they have a hard time bowing out gracefully. We have, you know, the famous example of Trump in January 6th. Um, in the most recent Brazilian presidential election, uh, Jair Bolsonaro lost. Um, and and for a long time, the, you know, world kind of collectively held its breath to see if he would actually stand down or if he would, you know, try to stay in power by, you know, getting the military to side with him or something. Um, that mm. didn't happen. I think it, it didn't happen not because uh, uh, Bolsonaro didn't want to do it, but because he couldn't get the support of the military and the and the bureaucracy um, to try to stay in power. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to um, flag this for for listeners to see. You know, um, after Sunday, if Erdogan does lose, will he uh, will he step aside or will he try to um, stay in office? This this article suggests that it would be hard for Erdogan to do so. Um, uh, of course, he's lost a lot of popularity. I think um, his response to the uh, earthquake um, that happened several months ago really kind of damaged his popularity, especially in, in parts of southern Turkey that were most affected by the earthquake. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll see. We will. Well, I mean, yeah, one, one thing that was interesting, actually, Kılıç Darulo, the, the opposition leader, if he wins, he wants to return Turkey back to a parliamentary system um, and and restore the office uh, position of prime minister, which was abolished by Erdogan um, in 2017, I think it was. So, yeah, so it's, it's, I think there's some interesting times ahead for Turkey. And I, I honestly hope that there isn't violence or anything like that. I hope they don't have a January the 6th style um, incident. Um, but it's definitely one to kind of keep an eye on over uh -huh. the next few a uh, few days really cuz um yeah yeah i think if he if erdogan does lose and 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 leaves office and you know this guy takes over i think the biggest changes will just be inside turkey itself you know your point that um erdogan consolidated a lot of uh national state power around him 
um, and uh, his challenger here would would want to kind of reverse that. Foreign policy wise, this guy's a bit a bit friendlier to the West than Erdogan was, but their their yeah, yeah. policy vis a vis Russia and and Ukraine is kind of essentially the same. Um, he said that he would he would continue to be kind of a middleman between Russia and and the West. Mm, mm. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to I remind myself of, sort of Turkey's relations with Russia at the moment. I mean, are they because they certainly are they buying what are they buying from Russia? They were buying uh, the the air defense system that uh, really advanced air defense air defense was at the S 300s. They were buying. They wanted to, I believe, buy that from the Russians for a while, which was an issue that you would plug in these advanced Russian air defense systems into NATO's larger air defense system. Um, that was a that was an intelligence issue, a counterintelligence issue for a while. That you know, if there's I don't know back doors inside the software that govern these air defense systems, would would the Russians have a, a wider view into NATO's air defenses? Um, I, I believe that that deal was stopped. But I mean, since the since the invasion of Ukraine, um, uh, Turkey's been um, or tried to position itself as a bit of a of a of a mediator. I think they were kind of crucial mm. um, to the issue of getting uh, Ukrainian grain out of out of their ports and into um, global markets, which a lot of the global South uh, really depends on Ukrainian grain. Um, mm. to to you know function, um, Roman Abramovich I think was in Istanbul a lot in the opening days of the war, um, trying to a not lose his yacht or or Chelsea and b trying to you know negotiate some kind of a, a ceasefire which didn't quite work out. But yeah, they've been they've been a, a bit of a broker between the two. But we'll find out. Well, th- thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, it was an interesting one, that one. And so, uh, yeah, everybody, please just sort of keep an eye out over the weekend and see what happens. And uh, let's hope it's whatever happens, it leads to a positive in some respect. So uh, there we go. So I think I think we will uh, wrap up for today. So, you know, Matt, thank you so much for joining me today. Are you up to anything interesting in the weeks ahead? Not a whole lot. Just uh, tending to work away on the same stuff I've been working on. Um, yeah, it's getting to be... It's getting to be summertime here pretty pretty soon, almost. Yeah. What about you? Well, it's funny. I was thinking about this today with regards to the weather. You'd say it's summertime. So officially we're in summer. Well, we're not in summer. We're in spring. Um, but it's been consistently grey um, <laughs> in the UK, except for some mornings. It's been quite nice in the morning. Um, and I've been making the mistake of trying to go for walks in the afternoon. So it's just consistently grey. But um, apart from weather complaints, um, I've had I'm in the National Archives on Wednesday. Uh just doing some research for a project I'm working on and uh, then it's my birthday on Thursday so I'm a year older am I a year wiser I don't know happy birthday thank you thank you um and it'll probably be a martini or two consumed that day um nice. and then apart from that that's probably the biggest event of the week um <laughs> and then yeah apart from that just sort of um yeah just doing lots of work stuff so uh, yeah keeping an eye on all things spy related for our next episode so yes. um yeah matt thank you so where can listeners uh, find out more about you and your book my website probably the best place to do that that's uh mattfulton.net um or on um twitter i'm at fulton matt um for a little while longer still i don't know how much longer i'll be on uh very active on twitter but we'll see <laughs> make sure it's every 30 days because apparently they're going to kick you off after that if you don't log in every 30 days, your days are numbered. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping uh I'm I'm on the waiting list for 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 Blue Sky. Um and I, I'm hoping that kind of that takes off and people move over there. Um yeah, just getting very very tired of, of Twitter. But I'm kind of addicted to it, so I need I need another mm. I need mm. another place for my addiction to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i i have a love-hate relationship with twitter i i uh i love the f- the use of twitter as a research tool because honestly it's helped this podcast dramatically as a research tool um mm-hmm. and my attention is to drawn you know most of the articles that we end up discussing usually have appeared in my feed on twitter via yeah. someone um i trust as a sort of source um so it'd be a real shame to lose it. But at the same time, I really hate the direction Twitter's going in. I don't like the management. I'll put it that no. way. Um, 
And yeah, so I would I would like the function of Twitter to move somewhere else that's not run by crypto fascists. That's what I want. I agree. I agree. So we'll see until yeah, until a decent viable alternative comes along or we're forced out. Um, you can still follow us on Twitter by going to at Secrets and Spies. We're also on Instagram at Secrets and Spies. And we're on Facebook with at Secrets and Spies as well. So you can sort of follow us there. Um, I want to just quickly say a huge thank you to everybody who's been leaving reviews. We've had some lovely reviews on our on our website recently. Um, yeah. So if you are listening to this, uh, please do leave a review because all reviews sort of boost our algorithm and help people find the show. And lastly, if you do like this show, please support us by becoming a patreon subscriber if you go to patreon.com forward slash secrets and spies you can get a free cup or free set of coasters for joining our patreon and on top of that we hopefully have some new exciting things coming up on patreon we are now going to start doing a little an extra shot of espresso martini so most episodes usually last about an hour so we're going to give you a little bit more as we look at some sort of spy stories that caught our eye but we just didn't discuss in the first hour so keep an eye out for that so everybody thank you so much for listening today and uh, look after yourselves and we will catch you on the next one take care thanks for listening this is secrets and spies Thank you.